Thank you. So it's kind of I haven't been in HTML a couple of years, so it's really good good to come back. It was uh, I was hibernating for two years in you know a dark room uh, in, <laughs> in the Obama campaign, and it's kind of good to come out. Uh, and be able to talk about some of the things that as much as tried to move away, it's been almost a year since the campaign ended, as much as tried to move away and talk about other things, the questions I get are always about the Obama campaign because people are always curious. So this talk is going to be in kind of two parts. One, machine learning for subjective good. If you're American, you know, 50% of people think it was good, 50% think it was bad, uh, slightly higher than 50% think it was good. And then moving to what we can all agree, you know, are, are generally good things um, afterwards. So it'll be a two-part talk. Um, the first part is going to talk more about elections and, and how we use machine learning and data mining in the election campaign. Um, and then it's going to move over to some of the recent work I've been doing with nonprofits and governments on um, education, healthcare, energy, public safety type of things. Um, so the campaign um, was in. Interesting, you know, so it happened about a year ago. I don't have that many slides, but I put them there in case people start falling asleep and you wake up, you remember where you are. Uh, and if I fall asleep, you know, I can also see what I've already talked about, so I don't have to uh, repeat it. Um, but so, yeah, you know, elections happened about a year ago, and, and most of you here are not Americans, and as every American, you know, is very special, and elections are very special. Like, let me give you sort of how elections in America work. So. There are um, 50 states, and different states get different number of what's called electoral votes. And so California gets 55 votes, and there's a state called North Dakota, which you never need to know about, <laughs> but it gets three votes. Um, it's probably a little more than they need, uh, given that nobody lives there, um, but they get a certain number of votes. And, and the, the total number of electoral votes uh, are five, um, um, sorry, um, 538. And so the goal is to win the majority of electoral votes. It's not a direct democracy. It's uh, you have to get 270, which is the majority. Um, and every state is winner take all. So except for two states, but let's not worry about that. Uh, <laughs> which is why I'm giving you a quick overview. Uh, so every state is winner take all. Um, you get 50.01 percent of the votes, and you win the state. You get all the votes for that state. And you win 270 votes, and you win the election. So the, the important thing to know here is that you could win the top 25 states in the country, that's 13 states, um, and win the election. Um, but that doesn't happen because all the big states, uh, California, Texas, New York, uh, are all very polarized. So you can't really change which direction they go into. So what ends up happening is you start focusing on the states that are kind of 50-50, uh, which you can tilt in a small way in order to win that state. If you win that state, you know you win enough of these states. So what happens is um, elections in the U.S. really end up focusing all their efforts on <coughs> between eight and ten states in the entire country, and those are not very big states. They're states like New Hampshire and Iowa and Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, Florida, North Carolina, Nevada, Colorado. Um, and so they're sort of medium, um, some small. Uh, and if you sort of look at how much money people spend in an election campaign, for example, you know, the Obama campaign raised about, it's all through fundraising, a uh, billion dollars. Uh, and overall, several billion dollars are spent on, on elections. The, the, if you look at sort of state like California, which the Democrats always win, um, you spend, you know, maybe a few cents, if that, per voter. You look at a state like New Hampshire, which again, nobody should care about. Um, if you ever heard of Boston, New Hampshire is a suburb um, of Boston. Uh, and um, it's it, that people spend three, four, five dollars per voter uh, on, the, on those states. So it's, it's a very, um, very, very targeted election. Uh, and, and it's not, you know, you really focus on a few things. But the reason it's important to know is that that's where all the sort of machine learning and data mining stuff comes in, right? because we were not trying to get sort of as many votes as possible. Um, we're trying to get very specific votes. And not just that, the objective function is really to maximize not the number of votes you get, it's the probability of getting at least 270 electoral votes. Um, and that's important to know because the strategy used, you know, if you want to get more votes, you would focus very differently. Um, and the other reason that's important is when so people often ask me, hey, you, you, you guys have a team, what if you didn't do this? How many fewer votes would you have gotten? And what sort of kind of subtle distinction that, that I try to get them to make is, 
we might not have gotten any extra votes. We just increased the probability of us winning. Um, we might have won with exactly the same number of votes. It's just without us, it might have been 50% likely. With us, it was 75% likely. Um, so, so that's an important sort of high level um, thing. Um, under that, so that's sort of, you're maximizing that probability. There are three, really three ways in which people get votes in, in the US. So uh, the three general ways are, um, one, you have to register to vote in the US. So every citizen who's over 18 can vote, but you have to go and fill out a form. If you don't register, you can't vote. Um, and so one of the things people, and um, one of the people we do in a, in a campaign is register people who are likely to vote for us um, because we're spending our own resources, every party, uh, ideally everybody would register to vote. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So you go and try to register people. And the registration is, is very painful because um, there is really no list of people you can register. Um, because if you think about this, the, the, there is sort of a list of people who are registered already. That's there. Um, and then there are people who are not registered who are eligible to be registered. And that means people who are citizens over 18. And there is no list like that. You could just do a diff. Right? Uh, it would be nice if you had that list. Uh, and, and so you try to sort of build models that try to estimate what areas are dense uh, where people might be unregistered. And then what kind of people would be voting for you? Because if you go and register people from the other side, you end up sort of you know, uh, getting negative votes for yourself. And that's not a good thing. Uh, so that's, that's, the one, that's one approach you take. Second thing you do is you take people who are already registered to vote. Um, and you try to persuade them to vote for your side. Uh, in the US, in the elections, people are exceptionally lazy. Uh, only 50 something percent of the people vote in the US. Uh, people who are registered to vote, eligible to vote, only 55, 56 percent of people generally vote on the high end. Uh, most people need to be you know, convinced to vote, and it's, it's not, it, it's really hard to do. So, um, campaigns spend a lot of time trying to convince people who already like them, who already are supportive. Um, they just want to go and vote. Uh, so getting them to vote, and that's probably a, the, the largest effort in the campaign is just getting people to vote because it's easier than persuading people to vote for you. If they already like you, um, you can just push them out of their houses and say, go and vote. That's all you need to do. Um, so those are the three ways in which we get votes. Um, in order to get those votes, you need, you need two resources. You need um, uh, money and you need you know, a billion dollars of money, unfortunately. Uh, and um, you need people, because a lot of this work really happens through individual contacts. It's not happening uh, you know, as much as you hear about sort of social media and, and, and you know, internet. A lot of this is really happening through individual contacts, through knocking on, going to people's houses. Again, that's very foreign, you know, both literally and uh, in other ways to other countries where you're going to go to somebody's house and, and ask them to vote for a particular candidate. That happens, you know, so in our, in the campaign, about two and a, had about two and a half million volunteers who made 150 million contacts through phone calls or going door to door, um, trying to get people to persuade them to vote for Obama or to go to the, to the vote if they already like him uh, and, and doing all sorts of things. So without the volunteer and the, and the money, this is, doesn't happen. And so what a campaign does is it starts with a little bit of money and some volunteers and a team and starts um, doing more fundraising. Um, and then, same here, they have some people, they start building a bigger team. And when they have this team, they start registering new voters, start doing persuasion. And then when it comes closer to election time, it tries to get people to go and vote. Um, and so that's kind of the, 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 the high level uh, picture of what a political campaign does. Where all the machine learning and data mining fits in is there is, you know, behind this is all sorts of data about all these different things, about voters, about volunteers, about donors. And the goal of all the work is, one, at a high level to figure out how do I allocate my resources both across these three buckets as well as across different uh, states. Which state am I putting more money in? Uh, where do I, uh, what's the right thing to do now? At a high level, that's the, the first thing we do is resource allocation. At a low level, we still do resource allocation, but at an individual level. So who are the individuals we need to go target to register to vote? Who are the individuals we're trying to persuade? Who are the individuals we're trying to go and, and, and get them to vote, to donate, to volunteer? Because everything happens, it's sort of, elections are, are in the US are interesting because everything happens, as I said, through individual contacts. So 
all the, the, the analysis that happens and all the models that get, uh, get built and all the predictions that happen are happening at an individual voter level. Um, so your models kind of need to support that as opposed to kind of being very uh, high level. Uh, it needs to be very fine grained. Um, and that's where all the data comes in. Now, the data we have about people, um, and if you, you know, a year ago were following anything in the media, you sort of probably heard about lots of you know, things that we had access to. It turns out we don't have access to a lot of data. Uh, it's probably the smallest data set I've ever used. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there are only a couple hundred million people in the country. Um, uh, and um, so, so that's you know, the number of rows, right? That's the number of examples right, right there. Um, and most of them don't really matter. Because they don't live in a state where you care about. So you kind of don't, don't worry about them for most purposes. Um, the, the second thing is that, so the, the main data source is the thing, um, when people register to vote, they fill out a form. And that form is a voter registration form. And that has their name, address, phone number, ethnicity, date of birth, um, and that's public. So that's your main data source, basically the basic demographics. Um, and then a, in addition to that, what's also public, which is kind of useful, is what elections you voted in the past. Uh, so we, it doesn't tell you which way you voted, uh, but it tells you which elections you voted in. Um, in addition, we sort of collect data on when you give money, when somebody volunteers, when a volunteer talks to somebody and they say, oh, I'm voting for Obama or not voting. And so those are the data sources we have access to. We have, it's not a lot of data. It's, it's you know, some demographic, some historical data, some fundraising, some volunteer, online data if you have our, if you're on a mailing list, if you, you know, uh, connect to us on Facebook. Uh, so that's sort of our data source. And then we have lots of ways of doing these three things. We can send letters, and, and we did. You know, as much as again you hear about the internet and, and social media, a lot of people are old. Uh, and the, the 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 truth is that the, the older people are more likely to vote, and uh, they're more involved in, in elections. And so, and they still read letters. So you send them mail. We send several million uh, letters to people trying to get them to vote. Uh, we have access to, you know, we can um, we do TV ads uh, on live TV. Uh, again, only certain people watch that, but we spent several hundred million dollars on, on TV ads. Um, we did 150 million, you know, phone calls and um, going door to door contacts through through phone calls and actual in-person conversations. Um, we sent emails. We sent about five billion of the emails. Uh, we have you know, lots of things on social media as well, uh, and we do online ads. So, so we've got these data sources, we've got these ways of, of influencing people to, to do something. Um, and so in the middle is, again, all the machine learning stuff, which says, how do I figure out who do I target for each of these things? What channel do I target them on? How often? Um, and, and that's sort of where, where all, the, all the work that we do kind of comes in. So, this is, you know, this is sort of all the data that we have access to. This is all the goals we have to, to accomplish. And then here are all the channels that I have access to. Um, and so the goal becomes, how do I take all this information and allocate resources, find the right people in order to achieve these different goals? Um, and so the way to think about this problem at an, at an individual level is, so we, we take every person, every voter in the country, and build a uh, several different kinds of, of models about them that predict a few different things. The first thing we predict is somebody's probability of voting. Don't care which side you're voting for, just probability of voting. Um, and that's arguably easy uh, when you first think about it. Okay, I have training data. I know who's voted in every election for the past several times. Um, and I have some features about you, and I have this label for the last several elections. <coughs> I can take that and build a model. Turns out it's, it's not easy because elections don't happen very often. Right? So the last presidential election happened four years ago. And yeah, you can take that as training data um, and build a model and validate and you might be 90% you know, right. Um, but now four years have gone by. People have changed. Um, and so even you know, somebody who, whose feature was you know, age 32 now is 36. And they may be different now than they were at that time. So how do you assume, I know, how do you deal with that? Second thing that's changed is that every election there is something special. Uh, so in the 2008 election in America, um, Obama was the, you know, the first African American <laughs> candidate running, so you had a very high probability of African Americans voting. Um, also, younger people voted at a much higher rate. So if you had built a model on 2008 data, 
you would have overestimated the probability of African Americans and younger people voting, which might not happen this time. Uh, so the challenge becomes, how do you account for these differences, given that you really don't have training data, because uh, people haven't really voted since then, and how do you account for the changes in, so as people get older? You know, so somebody who might have been single is now married, uh, somebody who was in a different age, they've moved around, how do you sort of deal with that? And we sort of came up with a few different ways of, of dealing with, with that challenge. Um, and one of the ways which we sort of, it was, a, it was a heuristic that kind of worked really well, was looking at, so we would build a model on the old data, um, but then use two things to, to one is, um, two things sort of modify that. One would be, we would take, um, sort of for each demographic attribute, we would take sort of joint distributions of age and gender, uh, and age and ethnicity, and account for people's enthusiasm um, now versus that. So, and so the way you would do that is you sort of do some polling, collect some sample data on how likely they are to vote this time, um, so how excited they are about voting. And then you build a model on the old data, and you adjust for that, but then you get collect some new data just by talking to people. And one of the good things about the US is people are fairly open and honest, um, at least for machine learning purposes, on collecting data purposes, uh, about telling you who they're going to vote for. So when you build models on by asking, you know, collecting data by asking people, um, they turn out to be fairly accurate. And, and that's really good because it's not generalizable across the world. People, some countries, you, know, you can't tell people uh, who you're voting for. Um, so that's sort of, that, that, that's one model that we built that, was, that, that sort of tells us how what the probability of, and I'm gonna skip the details for now, of voting. Second thing we do is we um, estimate the probability of you supporting Obama. Uh, so how likely are you to be an Obama supporter? Not voting for Obama, but just sort of supporting him. Um, and that's a relatively easy model as well because you just call people and you ask them who you're supporting. You can ask, you know, they might say, you know, they ask case Romney or Obama or kind of Romney or kind of Obama or I don't know, I'm undecided. So you sort of get labeled data across the spectrum and you build a model and you know, um, we're, we're all good. And, and typically, the kind of models we're building, we sort of, our, our goal was to kind of get, we spent a lot of time on these models, so we didn't need them, they weren't being updated in real time because things don't change that often, things change, you know, maybe, at certain points things change, but you don't, you know. So what wasn't, what was sort of more critical was that the people we had, they had to be sort of able to sit down and sort of really spend time on these models, um, and the outcome had to be, it was sort of, it had to be a, a, a good ranking, so there were two things that we needed. We needed something that could rank things, uh, rank people correctly, right? because what we're doing with these models is we're basically asking people to take some actions. We're saying, go to take this list and come down to the top until you get to some point. So the ranking had to be good. Um, but it wasn't only a ranking problem, it was also we had the probabilities had to be somewhat correct, because if in a certain state you come down to, you know, let's say the 30th percentile, um, the probability of the 30th percentile of doing something might only be 2%. And it's not worth taking an action in this state at 2% probability if in a different state you could take the same action with 20%, 30% probability. So you had to be able to estimate probabilities reasonably well. Um, you had to be able to rank reasonably well. And then you had to have a function, the, the, the distribution of probability had to be fairly smooth, you know, or it couldn't be clumped. You know, like if we've all seen sort of the naive Bayes estimates, right, where uh, that wasn't going to really work because I can't make ranking decisions. Even though the rank may be right in you know the fifth decimal, it still not and, and work there because we just weren't paying enough you know, because we weren't optimizing ad clicks, but we were, but not for Google. Uh, uh, we couldn't really get the people. So, so a lot of people we had were from uh, econometrics and stats and, and people who really didn't have a lot of machine learning experience. And so we sort of had to deal with um, how do we get people up to speed on some of these things, but then let them do what they're really comfortable doing and, and spend a lot of time feature engineering, right? Which is, as we all know, um, the more important than, than, than anything else. Um, so that was sort of the second model of, of <laughs> predicting how likely somebody to support Obama. The third one um, was how likely is somebody to be persuaded to vote for Obama? Um, and that one was, was tricky because there was no way to really get directly get uh, labeled data. Uh, we didn't really have a way of asking people, are you persuadable? Um, because nobody's <laughs> going to tell you they're persuadable. And it turns out what used to happen in until the last election, for example, 
was that they would take the model that sort of predicts how likely they are to support Obama. So if you take sort of, if you assign people scores, so zero is supporting Romney, 100 is supporting Obama. Um, what we would assume in the, in the last election was that if you're in the middle, 50, um, you're kind of persuadable because you're in the middle. Um, and it turns out that's not a very good assumption because 50 means, you know, typically 50 meant one of two things. Um, one, you're just not really, you don't really care about either thing. You're sort of, you're apathetic uh, and you're, it's not that you're persuadable, you just you know, don't care. The second thing is you come out to be 50 because we don't have enough data about you. And the prior is 50-50. Is so if you don't have much data, you sort of come in the middle and we can't assume that you're persuadable just because we don't have data about you. Um, and so what we did this time was we tried to collect data um, in, in a smarter way. So what we did was we ran experiments to collect labeled data. And our experiment really was, um, let's take a sample of people and ask them you know, who they're supporting. So they might tell you Obama or Romney again, you give them a score, but it means they're 100. Um, and then you actually do persuasion. So you send volunteers and you make phone calls telling people about different policies around you know, economy and around jobs and education. And that's designed to persuade people. And then you see after that, you, so, you, so you talk to these people, you see what, where they are in terms of their support. You persuade a subset of these people. And then you poll again a different subset. And now you can build a model on the difference of what kind of people increased their support, what kind of people kept constant, what kind of people went down. And now you can take everybody else in the country and score them. Um, and that gives you a score of how persuadable are these people. Um, and so what we would do is we would score people from you know, 100 to 0 and, and, well, negative, because some people did decrease their support when you talked to them. And, and so now you have a ranked list of everybody in the country, in each state, um, uh, in terms of uh, how likely they'll be persuaded. And that ranked list is then used in all these different channels. So when, you're, when a volunteer comes to uh, an office and says, I want to you know, help, can I make some phone calls? Um, we would give them a list and start from the top people who haven't been contacted yet, and they go down. And in states where we are spending a lot of money, we go further down. In states where we're spending less money, we stay towards the top. Um, and so that's, that's how sort of the persuasion uh, worked. And typically, the, the way people would, so that's the first, first thing, right, where we are trying to find out how people, who are the people who we can persuade. Now the second thing becomes, you know, how do we how do we get people to do different things, and that's I'm going to get to a little bit later. Um, so so those were the three kind of the three high level things that we that we come up with. We build these models to predict: are you likely to vote? Are you likely to support Obama? And are you likely to be persuadable? And then we use these different scores to take different actions on different people. Um, so for example, can I, if we abstract a little bit out and think about just take two of those um, uh, probabilities: so support and turnout, which is likelihood to vote, probably to voting. Um, now, if we discretize those kind of for now, just for simplicity and say, you know, you can be low support and high support and low turnout and high turnout, you now have people who fall into sort of this two by two grid, right? So now, if we take the people who are low support and low turnout, so not likely to vote and not supporting Obama, um, well, ideally you would sort of try to convince them, one, to support <coughs> Obama and then to go and vote. That's a lot of work. Uh, you don't have enough resources to do all that. Um, so you just leave them alone. Uh, you don't do anything with them. Um, and so then you get to the second bucket, which is um, high support, so high likelihood of voting for Obama, and low, low turnout. So not lazy people who are not going to vote, but really support Obama. Uh, and so what you do with them is you don't try to get them to support Obama because they already do that. Um, you get them to just go and vote. Um, and those are the people where um, you try to figure out, okay, how do I get them to vote? Because I can predict the people I need to target. Um, how, do I, how do I take the next step? And that's where, again, we, we, we do a lot of experiments, where we try things from people who have tried a lot of things in sort of behavioral psychology of what gets people to do different things, especially you know, things like voting. And so very simple things seem to work really well. And when I say well, I mean they increase your probability of voting by you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0.4%. Because that's really all you care about. If you can move people by these small amounts, that's often the margin uh, of, of you know, victory or loss in an election. So that's, that's kind of all you're hoping for. And so one of the things that works really well is you know, called social proof, right? where um, 
So one of the things we, we ran experiments and, and we found that if you try sort of two messages, and one of them is uh, not many people are voting, your vote really matters a lot, you should go and vote. And then the second message is everybody's voting, your vote really matters, you should go and vote. Turns out the, the less rational everybody's voting, your vote really matters, uh, works better. Um, and so we use that. Uh, and second thing that, that works really well is what's now called make a plan. And the way it goes is you go to somebody's house, you knock on their door, and they open the door, which is you know strange already that you're, they're seeing a volunteer from a political campaign coming to their house. Uh, and you sort of tell them, hey, elections are coming up on Tuesday. I wanted to remind you about the elections and tell you where the voting or location is. And they say, yeah, yeah, I know where it is. Just they want to get rid of you. And so then you ask them, okay, so are you going to drive there or walk? Well, it's America, so you can drive, but you still ask. Um, and they tell you, oh, um, I don't really know. So you have to start thinking, oh, do I know where it is? And maybe they do, maybe they don't, and say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to drive there. Uh, and then you ask them, are you going in the morning before you, before you go to work? Are you going at lunchtime? Are you going after work? And then you start thinking, oh, I've got this meeting early morning, and I have uh, to meet somebody for lunch, so I guess I have to go after work. And what's happened in this interaction is your probability of voting before and after this interaction has increased. Um, you're much more likely to vote now than you were before. Um, and so what we do is when we find these results, we turn these results into training scripts for our volunteers, where they get this script, where they say, okay, go to this house, and, and this is the script to use, because this script increases their probability of voting. And then we turn these things into others, so the initial social proof, instead of telling people, everybody's voting, you should vote too, you start converting that into more personalized things. You start taking random attributes of people, like their name, or their age, or their street name that they live on, and their city, and say, you know, three million people with this name have already voted, you should too. And that turns out to be better than just saying, you should go and vote. Uh, or, you know, 64,000 people living on this street have already voted. Uh, so you start converting these things into more personalized, slightly more personalized, uh, and, and that, that seems to work. Um, and so that's, that's sort of on the, on the getting people to vote side. Right? Um, the same kind of things apply in, in so, so I'm going to step back and so we're talking about you know, the people who don't vote and who, who support Obama, who don't support Obama, you don't do anything with them. And then these people who are likely to support and uh, are not going to vote. So you get them to go and vote. So you figure out who they are and you figure out what gets them to vote and then you start targeting them and getting them to vote. Um, and then you have a third bucket, which is people who are um, likely to vote but not supporting Obama. And ideally you kind of convert them all and try to switch them over to support Obama. It's again too expensive. People don't really change their minds that much. So you kind of let them, let them go. Um, except you find this small percentage that the persuadable people and you try to get them to be, to sort of find them and then persuade them. And then that's where the experiments I talked about before of talking to them and seeing what would persuade them um, work out over there. Um, and then the last bucket is people who are very supportive, very enthusiastic, and um, very likely to go and vote. So they're voting for you, they like you. Uh, and the last thing you want to do is try to get them to vote for you, or try to get them to vote, because you don't want to waste your efforts in undoing that. What you want to do is use their energy and enthusiasm to ask them for money, uh, and ask them <laughs> to be volunteers, and get their friends and neighbors and, and, and you know, anybody they know to go and vote. Uh, and that turns out to where our volunteer base comes from, that's where our fundraising happens, uh, and that's where people go and, and sort of talk to people to get them to go and vote. And that turns to be really effective. And what a lot of the work that we do in the campaign around data is trying to kind of point them in the right direction, right? Because you could go tell them, tell all your friends they should go and vote, and they're going to tell all their friends. It turns out people's friends are just like that. So if they like Obama, their friends are going to like Obama. So, so you have to kind of point them in the right direction. You have to give them exactly the list of people they should talk to. Um, and so for that kind of stuff, one of the things we did was um, we built a, a tool on, on Facebook. Um, so one of the things we're struggling with in the campaign were, as you, you know, 500, uh, 150 million phone calls and knocking on doors and a few hundred million dollars on live TV ads and several million pieces of mail. You're not really getting younger people in any of these channels. There, no, nobody under you know, a certain age has access to any of these things, really. Uh, so we were really not being able to reach younger people. Um, and so we built a Facebook tool that um, was really targeted at getting to those people we couldn't reach otherwise. And the way that worked was 
we got these people who are you know, enthusiastic, excited in this, in this bucket, and um, get them to come and authorize our Facebook app and ask for permissions to see their, their friend list and their sort of social graph. Right. And what we did from there is we would see somebody's list and there would be 600, 700, 800 people. Um, we would take those people and try to match them to our list of voters. Um, so, so can we figure out who the, each person is? And you don't have a lot of data, so you're kind of getting a, you know, a very small, very small match rate. Um, but the people you can match, you can now have all these things that I just talked about. You know, their probability of voting and their probability of supporting Obama. Are they persuadable and all those different things? If you can't uh, match them, you can still use this technique called maximum likelihood uh, to still figure out what their probability of voting is because you have everybody in the country in your database. Um, so if you find somebody, you know, John Smith living in um, Chicago, Illinois, you can take all the John Smiths, that's all you know, um, and who live because you know all of them uh, that we had on Facebook um, that we had labeled, that we would collect labeled data for. Did this person click back or not? And the features on that edge would be the interactions between those two people. Do they live in the same nearby? Do they, do they have similar ages? Do they comment on each other's posts a lot? When this person shares, does this person like it? How many times does this person update their profile? This person does something on it. All sorts of features that you can get between interactions and people there co-tagged in photos, people do other things. So you can take all these features on each edge on Facebook and then the label becomes when this person shares, does this person click back or not? And you build a model that basically estimates that probability. So now what you have is this mechanism for Somebody comes and authorizes the Facebook app, we see their friends, we, we calculate all sorts of probabilities, we figure out who are the people we need to, to, to target for a particular thing. For example, it might be voter registration is ending tomorrow in Ohio, and we need to find the people who may not be registered, are likely to vote for Obama, we find that list, and then we sort of reduce it to a set of people who are likely to be influenced by this person who's here, and then give them a list of 10 people they should target, um, and then we share content with them, and so we had this tool which really allowed us to, we had about a million people use that, it gave us access to 200 and something million people in their network, uh, unique people, and so then we can, we can choose you know, what, what happens with those people um, and, and who we target. Um, and so one thing to kind of keep in mind is that underneath all of these things are the same initial three models that I talked about. We're predicting all these things about individuals and then we're using them to make phone calls and door knocks and direct mail and, and sending you know, um, social media or things. And same for TV ads. The way we did TV ads was we took the same models and um, looked at data to figure out every different ad spot we could buy. Um, what kind of people are watching that ad spot? And use that to estimate how many of the people we predicted are persuadable um, are in that, in that demographic and then figure out the density of persuadable people for that ad spot figure out the cost, uh, and there's lots of the details I'm going to skip. Costs are not always known, so you have to estimate the cost as well. Um, and then you figure out what's the best TV ad to buy that helps you reach the most persuadable people um, per you know, dollar spent on TV ads. Um, the interesting thing in there, what's different from a lot of other things, was emails. So emails are not really designed to persuade anyone. Because the people who are on our email list who are subscribed to our email list, we can't email random people, they have to be subscribed. They're not people who are persuadable, they're the crazy, you know, the good crazy, not the bad crazy. Uh, they're the people who support us, who like us, they're going to say on our email list. So email really became a tool to raise money. We did fundraising through email and off the total billion dollars we raised, about five, six hundred, six hundred million came from links that were clicked on through an email. So the reason I'm saying that came because of email because I have no idea. I don't have any, any causal uh, linkage there. I just sort of have a link they clicked on and that's all I can tell with the email. There may have been other things that were influencing them, but 600 million of that money came from emails. And, and that's why we sent 5 billion emails. Uh, uh, and so the emails were the place where we could run a lot of experiments. Um, we could really try to figure out, you know, that's where sort of the ideal combination of building a model using the model to influence an actual randomized experiment, and then using the experiment to again get the result back and, and update your models. That's where it happened you know, every day in, in, in the email. Um, so what we would do is we, we tried experiments like, um, one of the things that happened in the beginning when I started working at the campaign was all my friends were in the US were complaining that you guys are sending us so many emails. I'm getting you know, two emails a day, 
uh, stop doing that, and I apologize in the beginning. I'm sorry, I know, I know, we were working on it, we are trying to be more rational. So we ran an experiment that for a few million people, um, we reduced email frequency into half, and for another few million, we reduced it to zero for a few weeks. And the idea was, if we did that, we would not make as much money during this time, but then once we bring them back, um, they will be you know, more sensitive to emails, they'll start responding, and they'll make up for the difference with the money we lost. Um, and it turned out when we ran that experiment, we lost money in the middle, but then they never caught up. The people who were getting more email kept on giving more money, and the people who got less email in the beginning never really made up for the difference. So then we had to switch, and, and you know, it was painful to say, well, let's send more email, because we, we arbitrarily picked a, a number to start off with. Um, we reduced it, it hurt us, so let's increase it. And we increased the number of emails, we started making more money. Um, and it was approximately, we were making about 15% more money for each incremental email in a day. And if you're raising a billion dollars, 15% is, is a huge number. Uh, so you had to send more emails because that's what people wanted. Uh, at least that's what their behavior was telling us. Uh, and um, so, so that, was, that was surprising. We weren't really expecting that to happen. And the rational way we thought about it um, is it, sort of a fairly simplistic way. It's um, we're sending people email, and the, the, so we're getting money from them. The cost in this case is there are two kinds of costs. There's opportunity cost. You can, if you ask them for money, you can't ask them for something else. The second cost is unsubscribe cost. If they unsubscribe, they won't give you the money they would have given you later. Um, so you sort of estimate their value between now and, you know, it's called a lifetime value, right? Between now, in our case, lifetime meant election day. Uh, so you estimate the value of this particular, particular person, and you estimate, you know, what you're going to lose if they unsubscribe. Um, and then you estimate how likely, uh, what does it cost you to get them back on your mailing list to somebody else. In our case, it turned out when we did that analysis, um, the amount of money we were making from an additional email was a few hundred dollars per incremental unsubscribe we got. The cost of getting somebody back after the unsubscribe was in the tens of dollars. So it made sense uh, to keep sending more email to sort of get more money, and if somebody unsubscribes, we can spend more money and get them back, and that works out to be you know, profitable in the, in the, in the long term. Um, the other experiment that we did that was sort of interesting was um, we did a lot of experiments around anchoring, where you have heard of, sort of you know, behavioral economics. You know, anchoring is, is a very strange concept, and if you guys haven't heard about it, you should go read about it. It's, it's just bizarre. Uh, you can anchor people with, with seemingly random things. Um, so one of the things that, that we did was when we would ask people to, for money in the email, we'd say, hey, give us $24 or more. And they would click on that, and they would go to a web page, which would have uh, lots of like, radio buttons, which would you know, have number have 25, and 35, and 50, and 300. Um, and it turned out that we found that sort of the, the, the amount of money they end up giving um, was a function of the amount you asked them in the email and the amount that you show them as the first or the second value in that, in that list. Um, so you could start playing around with those, you sort of build models on each individual and start playing around with those. So for example, you could do things like ask for 24, and then uh, the first option there is 30, and second is 50, and then you still have an empty box that they can fill out 24, but again, people are lazy, so they'll pick 30, and that means you've upsold them by 25%, and that's a lot of money. Uh, every small percentage is a, is a lot of money. Um, you could be greedy and put in into the 30, put in 50, but then they just close the window and go away. It's like, they're lazy, they could put in the 24. Um, so you sort of find this, you sort of build a model on, on people and sort of estimate what's their likelihood of doing these things, and then you start um, running experiments to verify whether that works. And by doing those optimizations, again, we ended up making another 17, 18% just by changing those, those numbers. Um, and, and those were huge numbers, again, for, for in terms of fundraising. Um, so there were lots of these experiments where you know, the results were, were very surprising. Um, and, and they were able to sort of you know, um, use our models to really predict these things and then uh, start personalizing uh, some of the work. So, um, so overall, kind of you know, the the um, the, um, the the structure for a lot of the work that we did was really take um, data about people right, and start predicting their behavior. And we all know we're really good at that. We can predict things really well. We can classify things really well. Um, what 
we hadn't done a lot of is, okay, I can predict things, but the goal is not just prediction. That's only a small part of the problem. The goal is to change their behavior. If I can't change their, uh, their behavior, if I can't get them to vote for me, uh, if they weren't going to before, if I can't get them to, to support me if they weren't going to before, my prediction only tells me, am I going to win or am I going to lose? It doesn't help me change the outcome. And so a lot of the time we spent was really uh, on the second part of, I can build a model to figure out what you're going to do, but then I need to figure out how do I change that outcome? Um, how do I influence you to change the outcome? And, and then the parameters become, who is the right person to influence you? Is it a message from Obama? Is it a message from your governor? Is it your friend? Um, what the message is, how often does it need to be given to you? Um, um, what is the channel? Is it email? Is it talking? Is it TV? Is it Facebook? Uh, all those different things that, that you know we really don't spend a lot of time on because we don't really do that many experiments in the machine learning world. In the when we do experiments, you know, overnight on a computer, uh, we don't really go out and, and, and sort of validate our models. Like so for example, one of the things you know uh, we did was we took it's a very simple thing. We uh, took people's Facebook profiles and. Uh, we got their likes, so all the likes they do, and then we some of those likes were web pages and articles, and so we crawled those pages, and then we built a text classifier that assigned them into topics. Um, and so for each person, I could take all their likes, crawl the web pages they like, and get a topic for them. So I can get a topic profile, and we've all done that. Most of them, most of us have built things like that. Um, now, in before the campaign, I would have said, oh, you know, I get this data, and then I do cross-validation, and hey, I have 88% accuracy, or I have my RC curve, and, and I'm happy. Here, that's not the goal. So the goal was, can I, so the, 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 the validation for this model wasn't cross-validation. The validation was, now I take the people, let's say the people who have put into the education profile, uh, who have a high probability of liking education things, I have an email that's about education policies. Um, I send an email uh, to the people who are scored higher <coughs> in the education, um, in the top 10%, let's say, and then I send an email to the bottom 10%, and I take random 10% people um, and send the same email to those three buckets. And if the people who I have scored highly in the education, uh, if, they, if they clicked at a much higher rate than the other two people. And that was the validation that mattered. It didn't matter I could do cross-validation, I could build a good model, because the model is useless for me if it doesn't allow me to, to, to take an action. And so the validation really was the actual experiment that showed that they have a much higher probability of, of clicking on content that they are interested in, because that's why I'm doing this model. I'm not doing this model so I can sort of, you know, build a graph, right? So, so there were sort of ways of thinking about it that, that were different than I was used to before, which was a, a lot of offline things and not actual online uh, experiments. Um, so I'm going to kind of switch over into the same um, the, the idea of you know, having these models predict behavior and then running experiments using those models to sort of influence behavior and then coming back and updating these models. Um, that's sort of the general strategy we used in, in, in the campaign. Um, and sort of what struck me after as I was leaving the campaign was that the same kind of problems are, you know, all the, 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 the big social problems that are uh, that, that, that are around us so they have the same structure. So you take sort of problems around education or you know uh, public health where we're trying to uh, change some, not only predict somebody <coughs> who's at risk of a certain behavior but how do I change that behavior uh, and how do I sort of do that with all the data that I have. The same problems appear in a lot of different places. So I started sort of thinking about how do we take these problems and start working on those problems because those are the really important problems. You know, I think we, we've all sort of you know, solved the, the ranking search problem for by now. So let's let's focus on something more interesting uh, and actually more useful. Um, so one of the things I started doing this summer, and I'll give you a very quick overview because I don't I spend too much more time on that. So I started um, this summer program at the University of Chicago um, that was funded funded by Eric Schmidt. Um, it was called Data Science for Social Good. So I just you know, use the data science buzzword because it got really good students uh, and it got people interested. Um, so this was a summer program we ran for about three months this summer at University of Chicago. And it was very surprising. It was a very last minute program um, where we just told people, hey, we're going to do these projects with nonprofits and, and governments in education and healthcare and energy and transportation. Um, people had two weeks to apply. So it was very surprising where we got a lot of interest from students who were a lot of machine learning students, a lot of um, um, non-machine learning students, and that was sort of the reason for calling it data science, because if we call it machine learning, 
we would get machine learning people, but nobody else. Uh, and by calling something else, we still got machine learning people because they know the same thing. Uh, but it got other people who typically, you know, will not consider themselves machine learning people, but are very strong cognitively and had you know, lots of physicists. Right? That's like basically uh, lots of people who are doing econometrics. Um, lots of you know, stats people, um, and lots of people doing some very quantitative public policy. So we got lots of applications, and we ended up kind of picking about 36 students, um, mostly grad students, we had a few undergrads. Um, uh, and what ended up being, we, we started this program with kind of working in partnerships with about 12 different organizations. So we had uh, partnerships with um, lots of different, both nonprofits as well as government. So some of the U.S. government, some of the city governments. Uh, some. So I'll kind of give you a quick overview of some of the projects. So one of the projects we're working um, with, actually, it is. It's not here. Um, one of the projects was with, 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 um, with a school in school district in Arizona in the U.S. and it's called Mesa Public Schools. And one of the big problems it's facing in a lot of schools in the U.S is that students who could be applying to colleges are really well qualified, um, don't end up applying to college because they live in these isolated areas, they don't know anybody else around them who goes to those colleges, so they just don't apply. Um, the second thing happens is that they could go to a really good college, but they think it's too expensive because, again, U.S. college costs money. Uh, and so they end up applying to this local, it's called a community college, it's often a two-year college. So the major public school was struggling with was that a lot of their students would, they thought were very qualified, they were applying to a community college, and the average rate of graduation was about 13%. Um, so they wanted to figure out this problem called undermatching, where you could go here, but you were undermatching yourself because you didn't, for different reasons. And so what we did with them was over the summer, they had data about school performance, so grades and who they are and their history and the test scores and some courses. And then they had data on where they applied for college connected and then how they did in college. So you could start building models for likelihood of applying to college and, and, and getting into college and graduating from college and what kind of college you should apply to. And what we did with them was sort of spend the summer, uh, because it was only a summer, the first step was really to identify the people who are at risk of undermatch, who are at risk of not going to college when they're fully qualified and, uh, and, and uh, of going to college. Um, and so what we're, we built these models, we scored these people, and we gave them the list. And now what they're doing right now is basically valid. And so, so now what we need to do is run experiments to see can we change that behavior. And you can't really call them experiments because you know, it's, it's not a sensitive, it's a sensitive term. So you sort of get them to run validation and figure out, it, does it, do these students look like the kind of students who could do that? And then you start designing interventions through um, teachers, through you know, families, through parents, and try to change that behavior. And so we're in the middle of, of that right now. Another project we did was with uh, this, a hospital in Chicago called North Shore Hospital. And the problem there was this thing called, this thing in, 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 in hospitals in the US called code blue, which is cardiac arrest, when people go into uh, cardiac arrest. And what happens is that the hospital sort of raises this code called code blue, where everybody drops everything and comes over and treats this person. And two things happen because of that. One is, this person is very likely to die. Uh, and two, there's opportunity cost. Everybody drops everything. So every action is much more expensive because they're leaving other people who, who could be in need. And so what we're working with them um, was building basically an alerting system, right? a, a, a prediction system that's able to early uh, identify these things early and then figure out how do I best, how much earlier can I predict it? Um, and then what's the best intervention to take? How do I optimize sort of the schedule so that it, it maximizes the, the overall health of everybody else? Um, the same for, we had another project with um, a nonprofit called Ushahidi, which is based in Kenya, and they were started in the Kenyan elections, and they're basically a nonprofit um, and a, a crowdsourcing platform, where people, what they do is, when a disaster happens, people install this, this software, and it sets up a, an SMS and a Twitter and an email thing, so people start sending messages. I need help over here, or so I, I see somebody is in, there's a problem happening over there. It gets used in elections. It gets used in uh, a lot of different disasters. And the 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 way they've been working so far is all these messages come in, and then you have these human annotators, the volunteers, who first because it's all over the world, they first sort of do language detection. Oh, this is this language, and then they might need to translate. And then they take that translation 
and sort of do what you know we would call the amenity recognition, right? They look at what location is it talking about, what are the people, and then they do classification. Like, oh, it's a we need to send a medical aid, or we need to send you know a police over here, and and so they do all these different annotations, and then they, they go off and publish this. Um, and what well, they've they've been very successful. They've had lots of people using it, but they're getting to a point where they couldn't scale because they couldn't get enough volunteers. So that's a problem. You know, we know how to solve. Right? We can. We can do language detection fairly accurately. We can do translation fairly accurately. We can do you know, name identity extraction fairly accurately. We can do topic classification really accurately. Um, so we start, we built a system for that. We take took their system, we added to their, their system um, these different features that suggest all of these things and then kind of pass it on to the volunteers um, who do the verification and kind of build this active learning loop where they start doing these things and then kind of getting improvements, um, and now sort of it's deployed into, into their open source platform. Um, and so there's lots of, I don't have enough time to go through uh, these examples, but you know, I'm around for the next couple of days. So if people are interested in more of these projects, I'm um, um, happy to tell you more about it. You know, uh, but they basically the idea was to span areas that were both sort of nonprofit and government. We had projects with the Chicago Bus Authority, so we could sort of see the crowding and how do we do scheduling for bus. We had a project with the police department and, and the local jail, so we could figure out, you know, prediction is not just crime, but what might affect crime. Um, so there are lots of other projects that, that I didn't talk about, but they span sort of, you know, education and energy and healthcare and, and uh, public transportation and public safety. Um, and they you know, some of the more international projects that, that you know, it's giving for now. Oh, well, basically the, the, the goal for, you know, what I'm sort of really excited about is taking that approach. So from the machine learning side, there is, you know, we, again, so we spend a lot of time, um, one, you know, um, doing predictions. Like we spend a lot of time classifying. We spend a lot of time with the first piece and we don't spend enough time on the actual behavior chain. I think there's a lot of opportunity we're missing because we sort of stop at, at a certain point, and, and I think most problems in the world really require us to take the next step. And uh, the people who take the next step don't know the first step, right? So a lot of social scientists do this thing where they run randomized experiments, and but they're, they're not doing anything before that. They just sort of start with random things. And I think we're in a really good position to to one collaborate with with those people um, and and really solve problems that that really matter, right? Because that's sort of the, the in my mind. We've got these skills that have, have, the, have the, the power to solve really important problems. And um, I think the problems that, that are our biggest problem right now are the problems that you know, affect all of us. They're not, you know, um, you know, I'd rather sort of focus on problems that, that really move people from the bottom 10% to the maybe the 15, 20% than you know, uh, do friend suggestions on Facebook that kind of make you save you two seconds uh, every day. Because who cares? You know, it's really not. Doesn't really matter if you, if I can move your search rank up from four to three, uh, if I can, you know, get this kid in school, or if I can save this person from going to prison, or if I can save this person's life. I think it's worth, it's worth slightly more than than an ad click. Um, and it's an opportunity to pass because if we are all working on those problems, nobody's working on these problems. So it's not that those problems are not interesting. They are interesting. Uh, uh, these problems have more impact. So I'm kind of trying to get people interested in these problems. So if you have the summer program that I ran this summer is going to happen again next summer. So if you guys are interested in being involved in any way, um, there's more information at this URL over here um, where you can see more about this year's program and then we're going to run it again. So if you're interested in being part of it in any way, if you know any interesting projects, uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys are working on those projects, so we'd love to figure out a way to collaborate and, and, and work with you guys. Um, and you know, feel free to contact me with um, any of these things, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. I'm sure you have some questions. <laughs> okay, stand. So, uh, a, a non technical question. In the campaign, who are you reporting to? The fundraising people, the political people, all of them? How was that organized? <clears throat> um, yeah, it, it was. So the way our team was organized was it was um, across everything because we had to be across everything because um, we were sort of the objective outsiders even though we were insiders uh, and so we were working with the fundraising team, we were working with the people who were organizing the volunteers and the people who were doing TV ads and the people who were doing social media and the emails. So we were kind of orthogonal to everybody else. 
Just like in a lot of companies where you've got this team who is really working with a lot of different organizations. Um, and, and that was really the only effective way because you had to go across them all. Because the data from there was useful in predicting things here and the models from here were useful. Uh, and there was a lot of cross uh, work going on. So. Uh, uh, the question is, that of course you measured the level of activity of volunteers, I, I believe. And, and I was curious to know, was that in any, in any sense correlated to success, especially in those wing states? Was that a good predictor? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so, a level of activity, I don't have a, the exact answer, but I'm just thinking through. The level, level of activity of volunteers basically tells you what, you know, the level of enthusiasm among your most strong supporters, right? So, uh, well, the number, right, but the number, the, the number is not that much, right, because it's, the number remains kind of constant. So, what does tell you is, so, a related number, and so that, that is, I think that's in some way uh, correlated, but I have no evidence, experimental evidence, to sort of have a causal link thing in here. But what does, um, one interesting thing that's related to that is when you call people and you ask them, hey, I'm calling from about the elections, I'm calling about the campaign, um, their pickup rate of the phone and, you know, how often they answer tells you how enthusiastic they are. Uh, and that's a predictor for their likelihood of voting uh, in the future. So people's uh, openness to talk or do something is is correlated. But the volunteers are, are strange because again, you could there are not that many of them to really do this estimation uh, well, um, and and you can sort of have the same percent but more. Or, you know, how much do they uh, get involved? And a lot of the volunteer activity is not a function of voting. It's just, um, Thank you. Thanks.